You are listening to One Nation Under Crime, a historical, chronological true crime podcast. Each week, we go through our nation's history and discuss cases from each year starting in 1800. I'm Kayla. And I'm Leah. And happy Labor Day. Happy Labor Day. For our U.S. listeners. Pretty yes. sure. I think there is Labor Day in other countries. From, I say this for a reason. Because I think there is. I just don't know if it's the same. Yeah, I don't know. Day. So this is actually a historic Labor Day. A Do you know why? Um, no. This year will mark Labor Day's 140th anniversary. That's exciting. So I looked up like information. So I was like, we do history. You, we look, I mean, right? Research I did some research. I'm um, shocked. I went to the library. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, the I restricted section? There's no other section in the <laughs> library. Um, so I was looking it up. And um, so this is everything that I found. So for a lot of people, Labor Day is barbecues, swimming, and kind of like the unofficial end of summer. Yeah. Like it's kind of when everybody goes back to school. I was going to say, you see, yeah. school didn't start until mm-hmm. after Labor Day. So it's kind of like everybody's one last like big thing. So, but like, why do you know the reason behind Labor Day, like what it actually is. Do you know why we, because we have, you know, Memorial Day at the beginning of the summer. So Labor Day. It's celebrating all the hard workers. Very close. Yes. It was created to honor the workers, unions, and labor leaders who campaigned during the Industrial Revolution for workers' rights, such as safe working conditions, that's probably a good thing, paid time off. Hey, hey. Actually being allowed to have sick leave without being fired. Hey, that's importante. And the 40-hour work week, which here's where I'm going to have a problem. Um, <laughs> you? Too much. 40 hours, too much. Anyways, I just... <laughs> Y'all, it's kind of. We haven't one, seen each other in a while, so I'm full of sass. It's kind of one of those things where, like, you ask for more than what you actually want, and then you'll get what you actually want. Mm. So it's kind of like maybe they should have been like, "We're gonna, we're gonna do the twenty hour work week," and then <laughs> then be like, mm, "No, we're gonna do 30. And it's like, I would have settled for thirty two. Let's go. Y- yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. but it's fine. Okay, forty. So Labor Day was officially named a U.S. federal holiday in eighteen ninety. Or, but I was not born yet. No, but there were already 30 states that officially recognized it. Oh, so on September 4th of 1882, New York City union leaders organized the country's first Labor Day parade where 10,000 workers took unpaid time off Ooh. to march through the streets of New York City to declare a general holiday for the working men. Men, women. Oh. I mean, they didn't okay. say that, but you know. I'm just saying. Many people credit labor union leader Peter J. McGuire as the founder of Labor Day, but that's kind of just speculation. Like it's like maybe he did it. We're not. He was probably involved anyway. Yeah, they're like ah, uh, maybe. Um. So why, when you think about it, did it take? 12 years to be federally recognized. So it was already celebrated in 30 states previously. So why did it take 12 years? It's not totally clear. Mm, Sometimes it takes a while for things to catch on. But it does seem that the official recognition was due to the Pullman strike. Ah. So remember we talked about Pullman cars for trains? Yes. So Lee is being reckless over here. I'm so. sorry. My stool See. just slipped and my <laughs> coaster fell she's off. She's having my issues. Cup um, that's falling apart in not here. A, not uncommon. Anyways, <laughs> so it was a nationwide railroad boycott, which turned fatal mm. and ended up putting a spotlight on workers' rights. And Congress needed something to smooth things over yeah. because they were like, people are not like, 
we can't do this. We can't not have the railroad. We have to. I mean, you have, have vital. Right. So President Grover Cleveland officially signed it into law on June 28th of 1894. By the way, Grover, favorite Muppet. Nice. It's a good name. It's, I, I do appreciate that name. It's not a Millard Fillmore, but it's fine. No, but he's my favorite Muppet. So there's another fun fact that you probably <gasps> I don't I love know. fun facts. Did you know that the Department of Labor was actually created after Labor Day became an official holiday? Oh. Not only that, it was the first department to be led by a woman, <gasps> Frances Perkins. That is fantastic. I know. And, it, you know, it is important to have a Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. I mean, there needs to be. The rules that we have now, some of them, I mean, some things I think OSHA. could be taken too far. <laughs> Correct. I mean. OSHA is great. I'm not saying no, that. I'm just yeah. saying like OSHA is kind of like a, a came from the department. Right. Of labor. You know, well, like safe working conditions. Yes. And they're, they're good grief. They need to be safe working conditions. You know, I, I love watching historical movies, uh, mm -hmm. period pieces. They're my favorite. Um, and you see a lot the women and, and children even working in textile mills. And, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's in London or, you know, set wherever. And you see all the fluff flying around, you know, mm -hmm. and they didn't wear masks. And so they would, their, their lungs would, yeah. And so, I mean, they would die prematurely because they would inhale are, all of that. What are those girls? Is it, are they called the radium girls? Oh yeah. The yeah, radium girls. Would, Did you watch that movie? Very good movie. I don't remember. I know about that, and I'm sure we'll actually eventually cover yeah. it on the podcast. I think it was on Netflix. I can't remember. That was. Um, um, I highly recommend that for you to watch it. It was a, a case at, against the company. Yes. Um, they were um, watch makers. Well, uh, it was watches, and I think compasses as well. Yeah. But um, yeah, they the, the girls, girls were painted glowing. The, yeah. Well, they um. They didn't necessarily glow, um, but they would, the radium that they painted on glowed and they would, yeah. they would lick the tip of the mm -hmm. paintbrush to get it to a finer point. And so they were ingesting Ooh. the radium and they would, they got sick, yeah. obviously, because we know now radium poisonous. So anyway, very, very good. But you know, those earlier things, it mm -hmm. was just the bottom line and nobody was keeping the factory owners in check, mm -hmm. you know, as long as they were getting the money for, you know, their, their product, they mm -hmm. didn't care. They could do whatever they wanted. Yeah. So I'm glad that we have the labor unions and, and the, um, labor, what did you say? Labor. OSHA? No, the secretary of labor. The, oh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we need that, but I do think that some things go a little too far. Sometimes I think that they can. I do. It, it could be frustrating. I do agree with that. and. But there's always a reason for the rules. We too. can always say that too, because uh, we've done workers' compensation before, so we know mm -hmm. kind of like mm -hmm. where that line can actually sit. Oh, that um, be frustrating, and some people abuse that line a lot. Yes, I think that's, so. That's what's that's, frustrating. Yes, um, just because we know about that, and mm -hmm. and that that is very frustrating. It can be used out of context. Mm -hmm. So happy Labor Day! Happy Labor Day! Now you actually know why we have a day off. Um, maybe I get to go to the river. Maybe so. Maybe I can sit on the river and, and listen to this episode. That'd be great. <laughs> well, you, you'll be listening to it twice because you do have to listen to it now. So, well, yes, that's true. Um, but yeah, so this is, we're to episode 66. What? And since this is September, do you know what that means? My birthday month. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Not where I was going, but yes, good point. Um, we eat, celebrate the whole month. Very also. I had no cocktail waiting on me. This, well, it's not September yet. We're recording this and it is August 31st. So, you know, just saying. Uh, next week. Um, okay. The countdown to Ghosttober has began. <laughs> <laughs> My birthday is more important. I mean, <laughs> I've already started seeing commercials. <laughs> I've sent you some for, really fun shirts. For Ghost Tober. Um, Y'all, I found her a shirt. It has a, a cute little ghost on it, and it says Ghost Malone. Ghost Malone. <laughs> I love it. 
Ugh, I love it so much. TJ yeah. Maxx has all of their spooky stuff out. They do. Their oh, start, oh, beautiful I love stuff it. too. I adore Halloween. Like it's this is one of my. I, I love fall so much, mm-hmm. and I just there's so many. Like people will be like, "Oh, I love Christmas," and I like Christmas. Mm-hmm. It's fine. One, you know me. I'm not like a glitter person, so that kind that of would be like me. that like. Eh. I mean, yes, I do like. Christmas and I like the decorations and everything, but that's just anyways. And I don't know. I like fall. I like the ambiance. Do you know my favorite holiday? It's not Christmas. Labor Day. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) (laughs) My favorite is Easter. Easter's a good holiday. Easter's fun. I like holidays that, hmm, what's the best way to say that? Don't think I'm saying this in like a weird way that are not, that are for no reason like yeah I just, like yeah. Thing, like they're just funs like thanksgiving is uh, allegedly for a reason um allegedly. we'll get there but i don't know just holidays where you don't have there's no stress yeah, there's no in pressure. the holiday yeah. that's what that's what i well, really like so i think it's i i think it's a lot of fun and i think that i don't know it's, it's, we haven't, the crisp hasn't come into the air yet. I'm waiting on it. Oh, I do. I do love, now my favorite season is winter. Oh, I love fall. Mm. I love mean, fall. I like fall. Fall is a close second, but I love winter because number one, my hair doesn't frizz as much because That's there's true. not mm-hmm. as much humidity in the air. Mm-hmm. Girl got, the girl got some curly hair, like yeah. real curly. Frizzy, actually. Um, But I love just, I, I love that. Even crisper, mm-hmm. like you know, just the cold air. I, I wakes like, you up. Mm-hmm. Like you, you walk outside, and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, it's brisk, you know, and your cheeks get rosy. I love. Now, I like. I don't like to be cold, but I like cold weather. I like to have. I like to layer and have all the snuggly clothes on. I love that. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm over here looking for a new comforter, and I'm like cooling comforters yeah usually i'm under a blanket while we record because right now she has a personal heater in my cat i do Um, not slips me so yeah so it's it's uh it's getting to be a fun time we're getting to fall which is always exciting and we should record outside one day I don't think we can't. So because we <sighs> have trains, sucker. I don't think we can because we have trains. That and I think sad. that noise would come through too much. Well, um, fire pit. I used to listen to, well, not used to listen to. At the beginning of the Morbid podcast, they, one of their episodes, they recorded outside. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> it's one of those episodes where they like say that they don't like the audio because it sounds like they're underwater or something. Uh-huh. But I, I remember it. They were. <laughs> They were doing something, and I don't remember, but I remember Ash going, I don't like this anymore. It's too dark, and I don't like the woods back there. (laughs) They were like, (laughs) so it It was fun. But yes, getting into the season. So we have our case for this week, and we'll get into it. I'm ready. Um, Our sources for this week, uh, CuyahogaFallsHistory.com. Okay. and a book by John Stark Bellamy II called By the Neck Until Dead. Oh. Which was a book kind of about a lot of it. Like, it was just about executions at that time. And I it assume kinda, that yeah, hanging was yep. involved. Mm-hmm, it is. Um, <laughs> so, it kind of goes, this was just a chapter out of mm-hmm. the book. So, each chapter goes through, like, something different. Um, So those are our sources for this week. It was very in-depth. That book was actually reading it was reading that chapter was like enjoyable. Like it was a good read because I'm used to reading court transcripts Uh, and the the life and confessions of blank and like all those kinds of things. So it was it it was nice to a nice change of pace. (laughs) So our events in 1853, January 1st, the first Horse drawn practical fire engine in the United States began its service. So, a horse drawn fire engine. Nice. Sounds real dangerous at the same time. I don't love it. Um, Makes me think of Pollyanna. True. Because there's true. one of those mm-hmm. going by in Pollyanna. Mm-hmm. I know. 
my mind just mm-hmm. there's you never know what's gonna come out in, from do. there just never know january 3rd we have talked about this person before solomon northup he's the 12 years a sl- like 12 years a slave oh, yeah, yeah. Him. um so january 3rd of 1853 solomon northup was freed after uh t- t- 12 years s- well <laughs> i'm sorry yes but <laughs> i'm sorry I was trying to read my sentence and what I put, and it's not making sense. Anyways, with the aid of Washington Hunt, who was the governor of New York, he was legally freed. Um, So we've actually gotten to that point because we talked about when he actually got taken. We talked about that in our, oh, what's her name? Patty Cannon. Um, Yeah, you're better at me. I know. Better than me at remembering. I had to You could have just stopped it. You're better than me. Oh, I'm sorry. That was a good one. You have I, to admit I set that, you that was a good one. I set you, did. you up. Thank you. Appreciate I, it. Like when I, I'm trying to, I'm talking to people about a case and I'm like, oh, I don't remember which episode. Oh, I know. You was. text me. You were like, what episode did we talk about this? And I was like, I sold Judge Pegleg. That's that, that was, episode. Yes. That's a yes. fun one. So January 6th, we have two events. President elect Franklin Pierce and his family were involved in a train wreck near Andover, Massachusetts. Pierce's 11-year-old son, Benjamin, was killed in that crash. And also on the same day, the East Florida Seminary was established. It is the oldest institution of what later becomes the University of Florida. Well, that's cool. So that's fun. I love all these institutions. I know. There's so many different things that keep coming up. Like, we're getting a lot of interesting. There's a lot of interesting things that come because I've kind of done, like, this portion for the next few weeks. Right. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things that come up on, on this one. So January 8th, the first U.S. bronze equestrian statue was unveiled in Washington, D.C. It was, of course, Andrew Jackson. Um, I was going to ask as if it has yeah. been torn down. I don't know. Good question. Not sure. Uh, didn't look that part up. In March of 1853, Levi Strauss and Company was founded in San Francisco. They make jeans. They do. March 2nd, the Washington Territory was created from the Oregon Territory. Hmm. March 4th, Franklin Pierce became the 14th president of the United States after after affirming the oath of office and William R. King, the vice president of the United States. So that's that's January 6th, your child dies in a train wreck and then two months later you're yeah being i was gonna say in. very that's, shortly that's after losing your son mm-hmm. wow march but his son was alive to see him win so that's yeah, i mean yeah it's that's a lot it's been a yeah it's been a week it has <laughs> um so my, what day was that on Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. March 5th. The piano maker Steinway and Ooh. Sons was founded in Manhattan by German immigrant Henry E. Steinway and his family. What year is this again? 1853. 1853. April 1st, Cincinnati became the first U.S. city to employ full time professional firefighters. No fooling. Full. N- no fooling. It's April 1st. Oh. <laughs> I was like, no, not fool, fool. Uh, anyways, April 18th, <laughs> Vice President William King dies of tuberculosis Ooh. in Selma, Alabama, <gasps> without having carried out any duties of his office. Oh, that's that's poor. Very quickly. Just, a, just over a month from being sworn in. In May of 1853, there was an outbreak of yellow fever. Wait, was he from Alabama? I don't know. He died there. I, I mean, up. that's. I, that was one part I didn't. I just saw. Oh, Selma, Alabama. Pierce was his last name? No, King. King. William, uh, William R. King. Yeah. He died of tuberculosis in Selma, Alabama. Um, while you're looking that up. Um, May of 1853, an outbreak of yellow fever killed 7,790 people in new orleans oh that's bad which if you will remember when we talked about pamela our our not friend pamela worms remember worms they couldn't take the children 
to the burial place in New Orleans because an outbreak of yellow fever oh, had yeah. just started. Mm-hmm. So. He was a senator from Alabama. Interesting. Well, he then became vice president and died just over a month later. Um, let's see. May 6th, a train ran off an open swing bridge into a river in Norwalk, Connecticut, killing 56 people. This is the first major rail disaster in the United States. May 14th, Gail Borden patented his process for condensed milk. Borden? So Borden, yeah. Not the same ones. Okay. Um, he was a land surveyor, newspaper publisher, and inventor. <laughs> May 23rd, the first plot for Seattle, Washington was laid out. June 21st, Russell Hawes patented the envelope folding machine Oh, in, War- I think it's Worcester, Massachusetts. That's, that, that town there's, is just so There's difficult. not an H in it, so I think it's Worcester. Yeah, I would just have to live one with. town over yeah. <laughs> so I could pronounce where I lived. Yeah, it, that's, <laughs> that's a rough one. July 14th, the exhibition of the Industry of All Nations World Fair began in New York City. That's a mouthful. Yes, um, but I would love to, to have been there. You mm-hmm. know? That'd be fun. August 24th, the day most commonly listed as the day, first of all, this is an amazing name for having created um, this thing. Um, So it is the day most commonly listed as the day potato chips were invented. Um, The guy who who invented them. Mr. Lay. George Crumb. (laughs) His last name's Crumb. But Victor? Yeah. Spelled the same way? C-R-U-M. Oh, crumb was K-R-U-M. K-R-U-M. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was in Saratoga Springs, New York. September 15th, Antoinette Blackwell became the first U.S. woman to be ordained as a minister. Ah, I love the name Antoinette. Antoinette's very pretty. September 24th, the first yacht trip around the world took place by none other than Cornelius Vanderbilt. I mean. Of course. October 4th, the largest wood clipper ship ever Mm. constructed named the great republic was launched in boston by donald mckay and december 25th christmas cardinal i believe it's gay i believe it's gaetano bedini Mm. yes um uh, his visit to Cincinnati, Ohio, sparked a Christmas Day protest that led to the death of a protester in a brawl with police. Oh, why were they protesting? They didn't like Catholics. It was cardinal, yeah. So I'm assuming, yeah, that that's kind or of still Catholics, around. Not Catholics. I don't know why I Catholics. said it like that. Um, <laughs> I don't know why it came out that so, way. <laughs> such disdain. I don't, um, and saying I that don't Catholics. Know. I don't know why it came out that um, way. I, I, I harbor no disdain or dislike for people who are Catholic. I apologize no, for that. It came out funny. so weirdly. I apologize. So this case this week, there are a couple of cases that we could have discussed. And I actually had, even though we do cover two cases per year now, for this specific episode, I had two cases that I could have covered. and. The case was, which is also confusing because both of them have William as their name and both of their last names start with a B. So it took me a minute in my head to like process it. They're both Willie B's. Um, So this case was of William Butler and it took place in Louisville, Kentucky. William Butler was a 28-year-old teacher from Indiana who traveled to Louisville and he founded the Louisville School. He was known to be a strict teacher when it came to class rules. In November 1st of 1853, was no exception when William Ward, just a name, brought chestnuts into the classroom. Ward, you have to under, you have to understand how odd it is for me to say Ward over and over again because <laughs> of. Anyways, I somebody else uses that name and it's very funny to in my head to. Anyways, so Ward's brother. Um, Well, Ward lied to Butler about the chestnuts and he was whipped for lying because this was 
corporal punishment, those kinds of those days. Um, Ward's brother brought a couple of pistols to the school one day to confront Butler for whipping his brother. This led to what is one of the earliest examples of a school shooting. And oh. for obvious reasons, that is not something I feel comfortable discussing. So I did not want to dig into that because there was a lot that comes with that. There, yeah, so and many, it's, there's... Yeah. With recent events, yes, that's a lot. I cannot get hyped up about that no. that conversation. Yeah, um, that's a lot. Yeah, I would probably get like a cease and desist from someone at some point <laughs> for my like thought. Like, I, it's just I have a child; it's very frustrating, and so I I saw the case before I knew what it was about, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Oh, that's the person for this year." Fine, moving on to the next. And then I looked, and I was like, "Oh, oh. no." We're not. There's more to it. I'm um, not. I don't want to talk about that. that one. Yeah. Um. So it's not like out of disrespect for what occurred, but it's I just personally can't do that. Um. That that's very very deep, and that's it's way too close to home. Yeah, and that's that's a big old can of worms. Yeah. I I got it. Yeah. I got it. So and actually in this case, so I kind of just did like a quick synopsis of it. The case eventually ended with an acquittal of the charges. So the guy, nothing happened. Um, And an outrage in Louisville occurred, which actually ended up spreading to the rest of the United States. People were furious that this occurred and the person got away with it, essentially. Um, One newspaper actually wrote, this was such a, like, poignant thing but they wrote quote an act that would have hung him in massachusetts has been justified in kentucky and i was like dang that's 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 all you can say about it i I mean mean, just knowing what we know and we've seen cases where people have been hung for things that they didn't even do and then like it's known that this is exactly what happened mm -hmm. and like that one sentence especially think about this you remember our case from a few weeks ago where they hung the guy with no evidence and people tried to Mm -hmm. not have him hung Mm -hmm. it was in boston massachusetts Oh. So that was just after this when like people were furious. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because that was when Herman Melville's father-in-law was the judge right. on, on that case. And so, yeah, it's like, oh, that was, that's exactly what that was referring to. Um, so that's part of what happened. It happened in 1853. It was November 1st. Um, so, and it wasn't Louisville, Kentucky. So eventually we'll get back to Louisville. I am sure. Actually, I think we've already been there or we've been close once. Um, we've well, we been to, about Kentucky. we've talked about, no, we talk, we yes, we did. We talked about yeah, bourbon. Yeah. We talked about bourbon. Yeah. I don't remember. This is where my brain is at this week. My brain is, my brain is gone this Her week. Her brain is like, like mine. So that's really sad. It's. This it's been a week. She's so, she's my rememberer. I know it's been one of those weeks where I've just like, like even Adderall can't help me at this point, um, because I already take that. So <laughs> <laughs> please don't OD. My brain's like, you know what? I'm done. Nah, we're good. Yeah. I uh, clocked out. Yes. Yeah. So I'm off. So April sixteenth of eighteen fifty three. A $500 reward was announced for the capture of James Parks, who allegedly, allegedly, brutally murdered William Beetson near Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. Oh, my. So in the northeast corner of Ohio sits the town of Cuyahoga Falls, claiming its place as the second largest town in Summit County. It's a very cute little place. Cuyahoga Falls was formed in 1812 near the junction of what was then like Northampton. It was Northampton, Stowe, I think it's Tall Maid. I don't know. Don't come for me. And Portage Townships. The main focus of the creation of the town was there were a series of waterfalls. We've talked about this before in another town that we discussed. There's a series of waterfalls in this along the Cuyahoga River 
that provided power for manufacturing. So a town just kind of like formed around it because they were using yeah. the water for, you know, for the for mills and, and different things like that. Yeah, so for the different uh Yes. Companies. So once the town was founded, a dam was built and then mills started to line the shore. There was a flour mill, an oil mill, and sawmill, which led to a major population boom in the area. And this area was known as the Old Village. Eventually, the factories and mills began moving downstream when it was found out that the power produced by the river was more powerful downstream than okay. it was right by the waterfalls i guess like the momentum of the water made it more powerful or maybe yeah more waterfalls I, like i don't more water yeah. more power maybe not sure um that's just what it said so the old village was actually destroyed in 1826 when another dam was built by william wetmore and it wiped the entire town <gasps> away oh yeah uh the town was actually originally named manchester but it was changed uh, later on. Now, we've had several cases where a town was named and it was changed later for like one reason or another, right? After like there's a person. Yeah, or- like, oh, or it became, you know, it was four towns and then became one or it was an offshoot of this or that. Well, this is going to be the first time we've heard this reason. The post office requested that the town change their name from Manchester because there were already several Manchesters in Ohio and it was getting confusing when delivering the mail. Well, there you go. Because I think this was like before zip codes, really. So they were like, (laughs) we can't have another Manchester here. Too many. Um, There's too many. many. (laughs) Um, So I just put, thus Cuyahoga Falls was born. I mean, because that's easier to spell. Yeah, much easier. (laughs) Much, much easier. So fast forward to 1939. Yeah, we took a big jump. Okay. I fast forwarded. That's what that was. A dairy owner whose name was J.J. Lawson started a store at his dairy plant in Cuyahoga Falls to sell his milk. This established the first Lawson convenience store. This is very interesting. Because today, we don't know that name, right? No, that's, not, that's not something we recognize. But, however, it originally occurred, and it happened here, Cuyahoga Falls, right? Mm-hmm. Today, Lawson is actually a franchise chain in Japan. What? But it originated in Cuyahoga Falls. How crazy. And it's like major there. When I was looking it up, like you could see it's it's like one of the main convenience stores in Japan. How but odd. it started here. It was very, very weird. Yeah, I've I found that. So the I'd be interested to take, it, it, take there's that a whole page on it, like a, a massive Wikipedia page on the whole uh like how it evolved to where it is now. Um so, uh, and then later on, there was the Doodlebug disaster, which was a train wreck that occurred killing 43 people. And it is known as the worst disaster to occur in Cuyahoga Falls. Why was it the Doodlebug disaster? It's the name of a bridge. Oh. Because that's actually the Doodlebug bridge as part of our case today. Doodlebug. Which remember what a doodle bug is? A beetle. Like no. the Well, remember what doodle bugging is? Guess not. It's the um, finding water. Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The divining yeah, rods. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People re- who use like spirit rods and divining rods. That's also called that. doodle bugging. Okay, because I always think of the Volkswagen. But it is a bug. Bugs. Uh, there's yeah. So because I drove one. So yes, doodle bug. Which is interesting that it's called doodle bug bridge and it's on. Water. W- water, which, like, of course, a bridge is, but like it could be over water. But right. that was just very, I thought that was interesting. Probably a lot of people don't know that's likely how the bridge got its name. Um, there you go. So there are a few notable people who have called Cuyahoga Falls home. And some of those include no one will know this name, 
but you're going to immediately think of something that I already put in my notes okay. that you are going to say. Her name is Jane Jacobs, and she was a pitcher for the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. We are members of the All-American League. And then Come. what's the other one? A league of their own. I know. But what's the quote? There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> That's literally what I put. I put Q, Q Leah saying there's no crying in baseball. By the way, Such a good movie. the series, mm-hmm. I've started watching it and I'm, I'm disappointed. Hmm. I, I have given it. It's just several episodes. Mm-hmm. I think when you redo things like that, it, it, it it's a, that's a big risk. Like that was that's a very known, yeah, movie. Like it and, was, and I didn't expect everything to be the exact same right. because you you can't do no, that. You can't. You, you can't do that. But I, I just I think that man, we've talked we talked about a league of their own recently too. Mm-hmm. In another episode. Um, just the. The focuses are not the same. The same. Yeah, yeah. they've shifted. Yeah. And that I happens. mean, I do like that they are giving, you have more of a story on the characters. Mm-hmm. Um, Which, I mean, makes sense, too, when you have, like, it's a series. A movie. Yeah. But, so, but yeah. So, uh, Jane Jacobs. I she was a pitcher. It. I saw that, and I was like, stop it. I love it. I do love that. Stop it. Which, if she was a pitcher, then she would have been... Um, I can't remember her Gina name. Gina Davis. Thank you. I was like, I cannot. Every Gina time I see her. wasn't the pitcher. She was the catcher. Right. But it, that's what her it. Her sister Her was sister the was the pitcher. I still think of Gina Davis. Every time. Uh, I don't yes. know her, her actual Kit. name. Um, so we also have Cheryl Gates McFadden. She was Dr. Beverly Crusher in Star Trek The Next Generation. I'm pretty sure that would be Wesley Crusher's mom. Don't I, don't, I don't, I never watch watched Star Trek The Next Generation. Never but watched what any was of them. interesting, so she's Cheryl Gates McFadden. She was also a choreographer. And in her choreography, she was known by either Gates or McFadden only. And then in show, like when in her acting career, she was known as the other name. Huh. So I want to say. She kept them separate. Yeah, I want to say she was Cheryl Gates for her choreography, mm-hmm. but she's Cheryl McFadden for her acting, or vice versa. So it was very interesting that she like differentiated herself well, maybe, for her careers. That maybe way. she started out one before she was married, and then got married and did. I the don't. Other? I don't know. I just I thought it was really interesting because it it was kind of confusing trying to read. Um, but there is one more person who, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, his name is Robert Berdella, and this is another, I, people are, might know that he, this person's from there, but a lot of people may not know who this is, and I know you don't. Um, he was a serial killer who was very prolific in Kansas City, Missouri, mm. and you might know him by his, like, moniker that he was coined in the media, which I hate those, but they are what they are. He was the Kansas City butcher. Oh, that just does not sound yeah. inviting or no, cool not at or all. Anything. So the first subject of our case this week, his name is James Parks. He was born James Dickinson, later Parks, but we're gonna call him Parks. I'll tell you when he changes his name to Parks, okay. but to eliminate confusion, gotcha. I'm only going to call him by Parks. Which makes sense. So when I get to a point that says, he changed his name to Parks, like, that's why I'm doing it, just gotcha. so it's not so confusing. Um, and we have other people that pop in and out that are named James as well. So I can't, like, just use the name James. So just kind of, like, sp- putting that out there. Um, so he was born in Yorkshire, England in 1814. Um, and he lived in Clitheroe, Lancashire, right? Sure. Yeah, it's Lancashire. It's not Lancashire. It's Lancashire. Okay, mm-hmm. anyways. Um, and he lived there till his early 20s. His family was known to be farmers, and he became a very skilled weaver. It's also noted that he became caught up in the Chartist agitation in the early 1830s. And, of course, this struck me, and I needed to know what it was. Yeah. Um. 
So according to the source of all sources, Wikipedia. <laughs> I was going to say Google, but no, that Chartism is- was a working class movement for political reform in the UK that erupted in 1838 to 1857. And it kind of hit its peaks at different times. Um, And the name was derived from the People's Charter of 1838. And it was a national protest movement. The People's Charter called for six reforms to take place in order to make the political system in the UK more democratic. So to do that, a voter, which, of course, that every man over the age of 21 who had not been convicted of a crime should be allowed to vote, period. I mean, don't women. Anyways. I was going um, to say, well, what about the girls? So, and then the second one was to create a secret ballot to protect the voter. So instead of your, like, not putting your name on your ballot. Yeah, like, so this is for retaliation, vote. right? Gotcha. Eliminating property qualifications for members of parliament. So at that time, to be in parliament, you had to own property. Um, Payment to those whose jobs were interrupted by going to elections. So saying that, like, you have to still be paid if you're going to go vote, Um, which I thought was very interesting. Um, And I agree with. (laughs) Yes. Equal representation based on population. So kind of like what we have now with the Electoral College. An annual parliament elections the movement died out but they actually ended up adopting five out of the six reforms the only one that they didn't do which was smart was annual parliament elections just because that's a big turnover for like to vote every year for that so i can understand that so anyways john parks claimed that he was involved in the printing and distribution of uh radical newspapers that had been outlawed by the british government This, along with poaching, made Parks a bit of a frequent flyer in the local jails. Poaching is a no-no. Yes. He grew tired of working 12-hour days and not feeling like he was getting any benefit from it. And he decided to leave Lancashire in 1840 to move to the United States. He eventually ended up in Bristol, Rhode Island, where he worked as in, this is the, I don't, this is one of those times I don't know exactly what they mean, where he worked as an overseer in a weaving room where he was in charge of 40 girls. And I put women question mark, but it specifically said girls. Well, it was usually younger women or younger girls. So were the ones that worked there in the factories, but it said he was an overseer of a weaving room. It was just a very weird phrase that I was like, that's not typically what we see overseer used in that. Well, I Turn? would assume so that, that I, it I don't, would mean I don't know. that he was like But it was the, Rhode Island, so I don't, yeah. anyways, it was just very interesting wording. Um, he didn't, up find, didn't end up finding the wealth that he had been looking for during this time. So later on, Parks ended up getting into a disagreement with a man whose name was Jim DeWolf. DeWolf. D-E, Wolf. DeWolf. That's He's good DeWolf. Name. Somehow or another, Parks learned that DeWolf's father was buried, <laughs> allegedly, allegedly, in allegedly. a silver coffin. Oh, my. And that there were other valuables inside it as well. Wait a minute. Let's stop right there. What is the one thing that can kill a werewolf? Right? I mean. I know. It's right bo- there. I mean, it is. I, okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. You, you made that connection I as thought well. the same thing as well. Okay. Because I was like. Well, how do you get rid of a wolf? Like, I'm, I'm just saying. Okay, anyways. continue. I just wanted to make sure that that was out Where there. Where do you think that last thing came from? Okay. Um, just kidding. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But anyways, Parks came up with a plan. He and another man rode across an ocean bay in a thunderstorm, broke into the cemetery, scaled the walls of the mausoleum, oh my. and entered the DeWolf family vault. DeWolf. They then used gunpowder to blow off the hinges to the coffin before rifling through the coffin looking for any valuables and frisking the corpse for jewels. Oh, my. After all of this, the only thing they found was a silver plate. Just a plate. So, Parks was out. So, they felt up. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Bones. The wolf. Yes. For a silver plate. For a silver plate. Oh, my. Yeah. After all of this, 
Parks was apprehended and served six years in the Rhode Island Penitentiary for grave robbing. Spoiler alert, Parks is hanged. Obviously, we talked about that as one of the mm, topics mm-hmm, of, mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. our source. But before he was hanged, he said this about his younger years. Quote, ah, there is where the circumstances that environed me, my 11 years in prison, my blackened character flashed across my mind and determined me in what I do. I had swerved from the path of duty and had lost what Solomon speaks of in that good proverb, a good name. A good name is better than riches. Ah, how true. So as long as your good name is yours, it will be a rock of defense against a thousand assailants. And without it, a single man shall put you to flight. There you go. So you'll notice I said he was sentenced to six years in prison and he said 11. Mm -hmm. He goes back for other things. So I thought maybe. (laughs) He served another sentence in Pennsylvania's Eastern Penitentiary for burglary. He and a gang of others tried to rob the house of a man named Mr. Kempton near Philadelphia. Even though Parks decided it was a great idea to disguise himself, as we've talked about the word before, we, it's okay in some ways. He disguised himself as an Indian because uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. that's not, that yeah anyways in poor taste uh in so many ways Uh, even though he did that mr kempton recognized him and he was caught so by the time of our case this week parks had moved to cleveland and this is when he started living under the name james parks when he was previously james dickinson can i say something though Mm -hmm. don't rob people that you know I mean, I know. Come on, people. I know. I was like, that. I mean, don't rob people, but I mean, yeah, obviously. Don't but rob. it was just so but, funny. I mean, the guy was like, "Come on, guys, dude, guys like, take off your headband." I know it's you. Guys like Jim, Jimmy, stop. Yeah. Just go. I know. I know it's you. I know it's you. But I know it's. You. I know it's you. Uh, and you will know it's him by something that I'll tell you later. <sighs> that's very distinctive about him. Um, okay, continue. I just, I, I just felt like I needed <laughs> yeah. to give that little PSA. So Park's activities in Cleveland are a bit elusive. He allegedly brought a woman named Ann Carpenter to the United States with him. They might have lived together as a married couple for some time, but later he allegedly, allegedly murdered her. Oh my! When she became inconvenient for him. <gasps> Did she it's exactly what it said? I don't know. It just said she child. became it just said she became inconvenient. That is not cool. Yeah. Murder it, is bad. No. It was also murder. It it was also murdered that he <laughs> it was also murdered that he rumored a man. Um <laughs> I told y'all, guys, this has been a rough week. Uh, it was also rumored. We're drinking tea and dying I'm drinking out sweet dude. tea. Like, this is not. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> maybe that's the problem. <laughs> My brain is like, we can't. It was Have also. You eaten? It was also. <laughs> I'm going to in a little bit. I have eaten some today. Yes, I do need to eat dinner. But anyways, okay. neither here nor there. <laughs> it was also rumored that he murdered a man. And that he was arrested at another time on a charge of adultery. So late in 1852, however, he returned to England and he married one of his cousins, which we've discussed before. Um, Her name was Bessie Dickinson. Oh, my. So Parks and Bessie. Oh, there, Bessie. (laughs) Bessie is just a. (laughs) It's a cow name. It really is. Um, I mean, sorry if you know anyone named that. That's just what everybody. No, it's a cute name. I actually do like the name, but that's what I immediately think of. Yes. Yes. Um, So Parks and Bessie left Liverpool to head to the United States on the ship Constitution, which we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. Um, There was another passenger on this ship, and he is the second subject of our case this week. His name was William Beetson. I kept putting Beeston in. <laughs> That's not it's right. It's Beetson. Yes. Like he beats his son. Yeah. Beat and spelled. Yeah. Just like that. Which is bad. It's terrible. Which then leads to. How do you get that? How name? do you get that name? Hmm. Because Dickinson, I can see because you're the like 
I can see how that could possibly come through, but like last names are fascinating to me. Anyways, mm-hmm. um, well, Beetson was known to be a pickpocket and he was from Yorkshire. What happened on the journey isn't really known and it can't be found in any court documents. Um, but there were several passengers that were robbed during this trip. Shocking. Once Parks realized what was going on, he suspected Beetson was the cause. However, later, more people claimed that the two men were actually more likely working together. They were Parks, in cahoots. Yeah, and Parks just wouldn't admit it. Um, once they arrived in the United States, Parks and Bessie settled near Cleveland, where Parks was quickly suspected of an armed robbery of a man named Joel Scranton. His involvement in the crime was never fully proved, and so he wasn't ever charged. Then in early April 1853, William Beetson found himself in town and somehow ran into James Parks. Hmm. Beetson had a massive amount of money with him, and he claimed that he had sold a farm, and that was where all the money came from. Hmm. The rumor was, of course, not that he had sold a farm, but he actually stole all of the money in a scam that he ran in Buffalo, New York. Well, Parks didn't really seem to care too much um, because Beetson was paying for all of the drinks at the bar, and for Parks, it was essentially an open bar because the drinks just kept coming. I mean, free drinks. That's all he cared about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but the truth probably didn't matter to Parks. <laughs> Beetson was buying drinks without any limit and seemed to be really happy to see him. And this would prove to be the undoing of both men. Both. Parks and Beetson were seen in several of Cleveland's saloons. Um, and they were having what we would call today a bar crawl. So mm. like where you just go bar to bar to bar to bar to mm. bar. Like some people call it bar hopping, but now people call it bar crawls. Um, why? I don't know. I wouldn't hop from one bar to the other, but I also wouldn't crawl from one bar right. to the other. So not I very sanitary. I, I know, not at all. Um, and they were actually being quite noisy mm. while they were doing all of these things. John Richardson was the keeper of the U.S. Hotel on River Street, and he served them drinks at about noon that day, and later recalled that Beetson was, as we say, already in his cups. Um, if you don't know what that means, people, that means he's drunk. Mm-hmm. Um, Deep in his cups. In his cups. Three sheets to the wind. I don't know what else. What are they? There's something else that they say. Mm. There's a few of them. Um, <laughs> calling walruses later. Um, that's another one. <laughs> <Yeah>. So, um, <laughs> well, that's so, another one. Yeah. So he was already, I was trying to think of what the Southern ones are. And I know in his cups is one of them that a lot of people will say he was already in his cups. Um, But Parks actually remained relatively sober. Inebriated. Inebriated is is that, yep. Mm -hmm. Um, Two hours later, at the Pittsburgh Street Saloon, Beetson managed to make the bartender, James Burton, pretty mad. Um, Beetson was drinking obscene amounts of brandy and began bragging about how much money he had. He started flashing $20 bills, $50 bills, well, gold pieces at this time, but... Yeah, but still. Anyways. And the bartender was afraid that if Beetson didn't chill out, he might be robbed. He was mm-hmm. like, dude, I can't deal with this in, in my bar. The bartender told him to stash his money away or get out. Parks seemed to st- <laughs> Parks was actually near him and seemed to still be nursing the same beer he ordered when he arrived. And Beetson was just keeping going. I I mean, yeah. So they left the bar and mentioned that they were going to Pittsburgh, but they never made it there. And it's unclear whether they were actually going there. Uh, The men took the train and apparently (laughs) I, I said the men took the train and apparently had road sodas. And I put in parentheses, you should probably define this here. Yeah. Do you know what a road soda is? Um, no. So, <laughs> road soda is like when you take a drink with you, uh-huh. but you shouldn't. Like, you're a passenger in a car, uh-huh. and you take 
some concoction and put it in a cup oh, and take it with you. Nice. That's what's known as a road soda. Oh, hi, Dan. <laughs> so I put, apparently they had road sodas in hand when they boarded because one, one said they had brandy. The other one said they had beer. The other one, like just different things. So okay, I was like, mm, that's a good place for this word to come in handy. Yeah. So never heard <laughs> of it. Yes, that's, I, I don't know where I heard that word before. But anyways, the conductor recalled that Beetson was so drunk, he could barely show his ticket when he was asked for it. But oh. Parks still seemed pretty sober. The two men swapped trains at one of the stops and went to Cuyahoga Falls. Once there, they walked to the American Hotel that was ran by A.W. Hall, and it was actually right near the falls. Parks and Beeson stayed in Hall's tavern room for about an hour. They were just drinking, smoking, having themselves a good time. And Parks was bragging about the considerable amount of cash that his, he kept calling Beeson his brother-in-law. I don't know. I guess it's just like a way to explain who he was. I have no idea. So he kept bragging about how much cash his brother-in-law was carrying. Parks kept making witty, witty remarks and maintained enough sobriety to make A.W. Hall, who was like ran the hotel, suspect that Parks intended to rob his, quote, brother-in-law later on. And at 11.02, Mr. Hall refused to serve the two men any more alcohol. He was like, you're cut off. You're done. Yeah. Go. Something's up. Yeah, this, yeah. Yeah. So you need to go. Um, Beeson was so drunk that he forgot his coat at the hotel. But perhaps the last person to hear, if not actually see them, was Miss Eunice Gaylord. I like the name Eunice. That's just a cute, I don't know. I, it's, it makes you think of the Cosby show. Yeah. Eunice Chantilly. I like it. It's such a cute little name. Anyways. So sometime after 11 p.m. on April 13th of 1853, Miss Eunice heard two men outside her door arguing about directions. They were walking kind of like one behind the other, so they weren't side by side. Mm-hmm. Um, she heard one of them saying no to which the other man replied, we will go up and around. About seven o'clock the next morning, two boys, it just says they were named Allie and Waters, which sounds like a buddy cop film, Allie and Waters. (laughs) It does, it Um, does. (laughs) They discovered large pools of blood about half a mile. That is never good. From the American Hotel and near where the railroad crossed both the road and the Cuyahoga River. It's never a good sign. Well, other searchers soon arrived on the scene to find, I'm going to go ahead and tell you here. It's pretty brutal. Um, It does not sound pretty. If you want to skip forward, uh, now would be a good time. Um, Other searchers soon arrived on the scene to find a vest button, a cane, human brains, and a great deal of blood splashed about head high on one of the supports under the Doodlebug Bridge. Oh. Yeah. There were two sets of muddy, muddy footprints leading up to, like, under the bridge, and only one set leading towards the river, towards which something heavy and bloody had been dragged. I bet I can yeah. tell you what it was. In a nearby canal, they found a, um, they found a suit like a men's suit. They put it, they kind of worded it very oddly, but from what I gathered, it's just like a man's suit that mm-hmm. had been cut into pieces, a man's hat. And uh, it was all on a stump, kind of like everything was kind of thrown about. Mm-hmm. The clothing was soon identified as belonging to the man who had been seen so drunk at the American hotel the previous night. Immediately, James Parks became a wanted man, even before William Beetson's Again, if you want to skip forward now. Even before William Beetson's headless, naked corpse was found the following morning floating in the Cuyahoga River. Ugh. Yeah. That's not cool. Yeah. So this next part is actually directly from that chapter in um, Until Dead, like, that I read in there the because he, dead. he, he really 
laid it out really well as to what happened next. So like, I just want to, that this is all credited. This is literally word for word. What was there just cause it was so good. <laughs> um, Park's trail was first spotted by a canal boat driver who saw him walking by the towpath at about midnight. Another driver saw him three hours later and at 830 in the morning of April 14th, a staple two miles from Akron, he hired a rig from Hiram Corey to take him to Ohio City. Pause. Doesn't Hiram Corey sound really familiar? I want to say we've talked about some, some, I don't know. It just, I just like the name Hiram. When I saw the name, it looks familiar. So Hiram. anyways, back to it. Um, that was about nine hours after Beeson was last seen alive. Parks explained his blood-covered clothing to Corey with the story that he had fallen off of a canal boat coming from Pittsburgh and bloodied his nose. Later that afternoon, Parks was seen in Ohio City inquiring for an Englishman named Clark and he spent the following two days in Cleveland before departing for Buffalo, uh, followed two days later by his wife and his brother. So they kind of like came and were following him. It was there that he was arrested by Joseph Tyler at an English grocery on Monday, April 18th, and he was brought back to Cleveland. Tyler, who had traced Parks by shadowing the eastward flight of his wife and brother-in-law, oh, had, smart. Mm-hmm, had also brought along a handbill that featured Parks' description, which he triumphantly flourished when Parks denied his identity. Surely Parks' appearance on this dramatic occasion, <laughs> this is, like I said, word for word from this thing, must have been the last word in some Victorian melodrama. This is how Parks was described. Quote, He is an Englishman, thick set, about five, six, five feet, six inches high, had on a low plush black cap, black sack coat, black pants, black satin vest, and had lost one or more of his upper front teeth and is apparently 35 years of age. His teeth were so distinctive. That's how people knew him. So can you imagine him dressing up as an Indian and breaking into somebody's house and the guy going, James, be serious. I I know your teeth, man. Be serious. And I just put, it was apparently his teeth that gave him away. Or like they're not the bloody clothes. Um, I think we're missing something here. If you just kept your mouth closed. I mean, (laughs) in so many ways. So many. James Parks was indicted on first-degree murder charges, and the trial began in December of 1853. Parks' defense was that he and Beetson had decided to go off the Hudson Road and take a more direct route um, to the railroad tracks that were nearby. Parks swore that Beetson's death was an accident when the two of them fell 12 feet in the dark through the widely spaced wooden planks of a railroad bridge that was spanning the road. However, the planks weren't more than 12 inches apart, first of all. And Parks claimed that he had been injured in the fall, too. And given his past with the law, like, he just didn't think anyone would really believe him. Um, So he stripped Beetson of his clothes, cut off his head in order to make the identification of his body difficult, and then left. So hmm. no one was there to corroborate his story. And given what happened like years before with the grave robbery, like mm-hmm. he didn't have a great track record. Mm-mm. And expert medical witnesses looked over the body and noted that the condition of Beetson, Beetson's body was not, mm-mm. could not have happened mm. from a 12 foot fall, right? Nothing was consistent with that. There were four wounds on the body, just the body, one with a knife, the other with a pistol, then a stone, and then a large unknown object slash weapon. They didn't know, but all four of those things were used and they only noted four wounds. So what is he doing? Like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do this thing. Okay. Now this thing. Now it was just very... Yeah, and for all four to be used in conjunction, that's not just an accident. Mm -mm. It was very, 
Like, did you just fall on all those things yeah. when you... Do you hit them all in the 12 feet yeah, that you fell? it doesn't make sense. It was further established in court that some of the injuries were inflicted while Beetson was still alive. Because mm. they can, like, depending on how your blood is mm-hmm. pumping, they can mm-hmm. determine whether you're alive or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, then, of course, there was the fact that Parks thought that it was a good idea to behead Beetson because... That's that makes sense. Uh, your friend, who right. mm-hmm. you're so t- horrified that they have just fallen mm-hmm. and and have has yep. have died from this fall. Oh well, let me just, just stick out the table. Behead him. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and because that's a smart thing to do. Also, the police, right, are gonna they're not gonna identify him. It's fine. That's a good idea. Yeah. So, and then <laughs> there was also the thing that. All of a sudden, Park's wife had, like, a ton of money that she couldn't oh. explain where it came from. Yeah. She just found it in a, ho- in a hole in the I wall. just found it. The jury found James Parks guilty of murdering William Beetson, stating that Parks deliberately lured Beetson under the bridge to murder and rob him. He was convicted and sentenced to hang. But. However. In a very unexpected twist. The Ohio Supreme Court overturned the conviction because when the determination was read, the jury only said guilty. They did not say guilty of murder in the first degree. Oh, no. James Parks got a new trial and he was granted a change of venue this time. So the trial was not going to be in Cuyahoga Falls. Huh. In March of 1855, the same evidence was presented and the same verdict was determined. Parks swore of his innocence and just a week before his scheduled execution, the head of a broken key was found in an inner door of Cuyahoga County jail cells. An interrogation of the prisoners revealed that Parks had tried to bribe another prisoner to steal a key and help in his escape. Keep in mind, Parks still claims that he's innocent, right? Right. Well, when the prisoner said no, Parks threatened to kill him unless he helped him. And the fact uh, that the key broke is the only way that Parks didn't get away because the key broke when he went to go use it. Wow. However, the day before his execution, this is kind of, this kind of gets rough in this part as well. So if you'd like to skip forward through that, um, just like a trigger for self-harm so there you go um however the day before his execution parks was heard shouting quote this mortal man must die you can't save me now and then he slashed his throat with a three inch knife which was likely smuggled in by his wife the jail physician managed to stop the bleeding and kept parks alive for his execution which we've seen that a lot. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, enough to where I was, I thought, huh, I've said that sentence a lot. Like, yeah, they were able to, he still lived till his execution. Like, that was yeah. very, one thing that was also noted was that, like, his wife was, like, still, like, smitten with him. Like, she was mm. in love with him. Um, uh, Teeth are a thing for me, so I can't. <laughs> can't do that i kind of kind of like my <laughs> kind of like my partner to have teeth um so <laughs> i mean that's just me that's just me that's my personal preference i understand you know there's a lid for every pot um i prefer mine with teeth um so anyways I understand um on june 1st of 1855 james Parks smoked his last cigar claimed he was innocent again, and walked to the scaffold at 11.54 a.m. Parks was given a glass of wine before he sat in a chair with a rope around his waist, which I thought was interesting. And then after reading on, I realized why they did that, Um, which is weird. But so he was allowed to give his final words. He was still swearing that he had been misrepresented by the press. He insisted that his version of Beetson's death was accurate in every detail hmm. and that, quote, as I stand before my God, I speak the truth. He begged that the news of his death would not make it to his family in England 
And then he said of his infant child. Oh. I don't know before. I don't know. Oh. Um, and his dear wife, quote, I had never known her virtues had it not been for my sad misfortunes. The crowd was so moved that the proceedings were interrupted so a collection could be taken up for the impending widow. They oh. collected just $49. I didn't look up how much that was. but $500. Yeah, <laughs> possibly. Um, he finished his speech at about 1 p.m. Parks drank another glass of wine. And then his hands and feet were fastened and the rope was secured around his neck. So they tied him around the waist and put him in the chair so he couldn't like run Run away. Yeah. I was like, that's a weird note to put it. But then it it made sense after that. Um, The permission was granted to give the death signal. He waited patiently while the black cap was put over his head. And then at 1.04 p.m., he dropped his handkerchief crying, I die an innocent man. There was no evidence of a struggle or pain when the corpse was cut down at 1.40 p.m. Dr. Strong in Cleveland found that the neck had clearly broken by the drop. Following his last wishes, Parks' body was removed from the view of the crowd, given a fresh shave, and prepared for burial and turned over to his grieving widow. Given a fresh shave. Mm-hmm. Why didn't they let him shave first? They were afraid uh, he would. Yeah, probably. Prob- yeah, afraid he would harm himself. Mm-hmm. And that is the story of the murder at Doodlebug Bridge. Doodlebug Bridge. Doodlebug Bridge. It was, it. <sighs> Sounds... You can't tell me that you fell through the floor of mm-hmm. a of a bridge, like 12 feet. I mean, I get 12 feet is it, 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 it's a, tall. Yeah. I mean, so I'm looking at my ceiling and I have a tray ceiling in my eating kitchen. That's probably 12, 12 no. feet. Yeah, I'm I'm five five. So that's probably, if not, that's at least ten. And just think two more feet than that. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to fall. No, that far. I mean I wouldn't want to, but I'm really that's good at falling though. Unless you fall on something like, I don't know, a knife or a pistol or a <laughs> You're not going to die from that fall unless, like, you hit your head on, like, concrete. Something's got to be really... Yeah. I, you would get hurt. something unusual. Yeah, you would get hurt, yeah. for sure. Or, like, if you have a medical condition and mm-hmm. you hit just right, like, you right. know, like, the kid's playing football and they get hit mm-hmm. and, you know, there's a, yeah. a, a heart condition or something that they weren't aware of and... I mean, I thing. can see that, kind of. Yeah, but... but that's not that's that not big of a fall. Happened. No. Mm-mm. So, and then for like somebody to ask you later on what happened, and you're like, oh, it was a nosebleed. Like, it, that just doesn't. All that blood came from a nosebleed? How you walk in? Yeah. And even still, even if you. So let's entertain, not necessarily entertain. Let's think about the fact that he could, maybe he was innocent. Maybe. We can, we can entertain that for a hot second. Even if he was, even if he was. At least you would get charged with mutilation of a corpse. I mean, at least. Uh, I mean, well, how? Why? I, it wasn't why? a why. That's not why. Is that your first thought? Well, like that's yeah. is what I'm gonna do. Oh, well, poor buddy, he's gone. I need mm. to decapitate him. Yeah, that's your first thought. I mean, that's so off. Yeah, it, it's very, um, and when they said that he, they found, you know, what they found to lead them to believe there had been mm-hmm. a murder. Um, I just thought about this. They said that there was blood splatter yeah. on the wall that was head high. Yeah. And they said there was evidence to say he was alive uh-huh. which would mean happen. he was alive when that happened because that's the only time you would have that much like blood uh-huh. spray in my opinion I don't know but that would be my or, what I would think well he could have been alive when that happened and then all the blood on the ground would have been from mm-hmm, the from other bleeding but and, I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking of that mm-hmm, one mm-hmm, portion mm-hmm. you'd have I would think you'd have to be alive. Like, I, that's just... Well, yeah, well, 
that could have been what yeah took him down, exactly like made him made him exactly. go down and then the job could have been finished yeah it's just while he was down it's just very it's it's a hard it, even if you were like i said even if you were innocent just entertain it you would still like mutilation of a corpse mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um I don't, there's something. But here's my thing with, and and this is totally not the same situation. And I understand Mm -hmm. this. In the story of David and Goliath in the Bible. Right. Everybody doesn't talk about this part. Yes, David killed Goliath with sling and stones. After that, he decapitated Goliath. Yeah. Which everybody doesn't really talk about that part or know that part necessarily. But it's. There's a lot of I'll just, hmm, I'll insert here. There's a lot of times people tell stories from anything, I will say mostly the Bible, that they kind of stop before well, the worst of well, everything they, happens. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, talking to kids, you don't, all, you know, that I isn't mean, always I, told. I get it. But anyway, yeah. you know, it was and held up, it up yeah. kind of as, it, it was triumph. Yeah. It was victory. It was a trophy. Yeah. You know? And so anytime you think about even movies that you watch. Mm-hmm. It's held up yeah. as a trophy, you know, in I mean, um, they would Percy do that. Jackson and yeah. the, um, you know, I mean, lightning like, thief, when they cut off Medusa's mm-hmm. head, it was held up like as a Marie trophy. Like Marie Antoinette, like when they did all of those, yes. like by held guillotine, they would do that to show that it was actually exactly that person. So it was, it's just, and to say like identification, like, okay, but he was still recognized by all of his clothes and I, anyway. But, but the clothes were not with. So then, where's the head? Because they never said they found it. I know. I yeah, so I, I wonder if it's about that. It, but I mean, in he, the water. He. I mean, so obviously he was trying to not let it be identified. I don't. I don't know. I was. I was going to ask that where. I. I I, they but never the said that they found it. the clothing was very identifiable. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, when... And then you tried to cut up all of the clothing and throw it around, and you tried to do all these things. Like, an innocent person doesn't... Doesn't try to... Do that. Yeah, I mean... In um, my opinion, uh, I will mean, say that. In my opinion... just take the clothes with you. <laughs> people do a lot of odd things when, when under duress. So I can just say, in my opinion, that's something very that doesn't odd. Make sense. No, uh, to me, it it doesn't. So, yeah, that's the murder at Doodlebug Bridge, and so it was. Uh, that was the case I decided to cover over over the other one that I had chosen for this week. Um, just again, the other is a little murder a little too is, heavy. Murder is always heavy, but like. The other I, one had a yeah, lot of baggage there, with it. There is a lot, and there is a lot to dig into there that, mm-hmm. like, I'm sure I would get a cease and desist letter from someone <laughs> um, that's like, you must take this down immediately. Yeah. yeah immediately. Yeah. And it would probably be our longest episode ever. It probably would be like I. <laughs> this is a three part. It would have like <laughs> an explicit content warning on it because I drank like half a bottle of champagne for mimosas and I'm already <laughs> on one. So I just go. I mean, it's mm-hmm. yeah. So. I try to cover like the quote first of things just because they set precedent, but right. that was just one that, one that, that I couldn't. No. And, I and I, I agree with that. I um, think you chose wisely. Yeah. I, I sometimes will review things and I'm like, mm, probably not the best idea. Mm, that one. And then there's some that I kind of have to be like, Oh, well, I kind of have yeah. to cover. Or, hey, Leah. Yeah. I kind of have to cover this one. So Sorry. get ready. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Patty Cannon was a pretty bad one. Oh, I don't like her. She is not cool. No. Yeah. I think she is my least favorite. And then Madame, some people say Lollery, some people say Lori. Um, but had, she's she's a rough one, too. That's, that's I haven't pretty... listened to all the things that she did. I don't even want to know. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> I forgot I kicked you out. <laughs> I'm glad you did. I don't even want to know. No, you don't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's there's just certain times where it's like that. There's that. 
you know, sometimes you wonder where that line is and then you look and you, you're like, oh, there it is. The line's a mile behind me at this point. <laughs> I should probably go back. Um, oh, back there. Yeah, oh, back there. Whoops. Oh, okay. Whoopsie. Yeah, see how far we went past that. So I hope everyone enjoyed our episode this week as much as you can enjoy. Well. Y'all know what I mean. But you got to hear us. Yes. Uh, we have a website where you can find any and all ONUC information you are looking for. We it's do. One Nation Under Crime. You can find any way to contact us there. Yep. Um, please go recommend us to everyone. Mm-hmm. Tell them to listen to us. Um, and also, please leave us a five-star review on Apple yes. Podcasts. We would greatly appreciate it. It takes like two minutes. And I know like I, I it seriously does take just two minutes it's not hard so if you're on apple Podcasts, if you could just scroll down to the bottom you that's all you got to do just scroll and there will be the place that says leave a rating just leave a five-star review with like a little comment or something saying like Kayla I, and Leah are the best. the best love them um anything i mean um and we would greatly appreciate it mm-hmm. uh we have a patreon where uh you can Join if you would like to help with the cost of making and hosting the show. We appreciate you guys for listening to this week's episode. Very much. Of One Nation Under Crime. We will see you here. Same time. Different crime. Next week. And remember, there isn't always liberty and justice for all. I shouldn't even have to say it in this no, one. No. But happy <laughs> Labor Day. Happy Labor Day. Be safe, everyone. No drinking and driving. No road sodas for anyone. No. And no on, texting on this, and driving. No texting and driving. Or no, boating. No, 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 no drinking and boating. That's no boat, bad too. No boating and texting. Because that, I that's... I couldn't even imagine. I can't at this point. But be safe, everyone. We love you guys. Goodbye.